So it's about uh, praying in Jesus' name, why God answers prayer, claiming the promises of God, um, keeping it simple. And this is our last talk today on prayer. And it's a... Uh, T's and C's. You know, whenever you buy something, it's a little guarantee, but here are the T's and C's. You know, don't wet it. Don't try to fix it yourself or else, you know, uh, the guarantee is all off. Well, there are conditions and terms for answered prayer. Can you think of them? I can only think of two that come up as regular themes for how you need to pray. Well, we'll see in the next slide righteousness that we need to be righteous and faith is a condition to ask in faith and they're the two topics i'm going to talk about today so righteousness it says in james 5 16 the prayer of a righteous man has great power on its effects it talks about elijah who called down a famine for three and a half years okay or, or no rain it was here yeah, no rain for three and a half years Righteousness, And by righteous means a right relationship with God and a right relationship with people. That's given as a condition to answered prayer. And of course, it made me think, what? Me? Righteous? <laughs> no. Which of us would claim that we are righteous? Well, I have news for you. If you are in Jesus, then you are righteous. In uh, Isaiah 61, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And God has done that for us. Galatians 3.27, I picked this up in the Amplified Version. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, into a spiritual union with the Christ, the anointed, have clothed yourselves with Christ. That is, you have taken on his characteristics and values. So I have been grubby, horrible, selfish Costa when I put my faith in Jesus he forgave me my sin he took off my filthy rags and he clothed me in, in Christ God looks at me and he doesn't see my sin he sees Jesus he looks at you he doesn't see your sin he sees you in Jesus we are clothed in him what an amazing truth so we are righteous we talked about that a bit a few weeks ago, praying in his name. And I can only approach the throne of grace because, you know, if it was just sinful, horrible me in fear of judgment, I wouldn't dare go near the throne of grace. But in him, we come with confidence and boldness. There's a big part of what it means to be in his name. Well, <clears throat> and yet the scriptures are clear um, about the need for us to remain righteous. Uh, it says in Psalm 66, 18, if I had cherished sin in my heart, now to cherish something means to love it and to look after it and coddle it, the Lord would not have listened. Now somebody once said, you know, you can't say about bad thoughts, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. Well, if I had any, right? Yes, you'll have bad thoughts, but we're not to cherish them, dwell on them. If we love sin, then God says, well... Your prayer has no effect. I don't hear you. Uh, a similar passage in Isaiah 59, I believe. Here we go. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. He has power. Or his ear dull that he cannot ear, hear. But your iniquities, your sins, have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you 
so that he does not hear. Now, this is to a people that were, for generations now, instead of worshipping God and putting him first, they were going after idols and all kinds of stuff, and there was no righteousness. They were a mess, and God says, that's it. He was saying to them, you can do your sacrifices and your temple worship, but I don't hear it anymore because your minds are in the gutter. They're not with me. Well, God made us to be in fellowship with him and we're to be like him. And yes, there's back and forth the communication we've been talking about the last few weeks. But when we're off over there doing something else that is not pleasing to him, why on earth should he bother listening, let alone answering your prayer? That's a pretty discouraging thought, but I have some good news for you. There's a guy called Ahab. Next slide. But God's amazing mercy and grace. There was, uh, there was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab. Of all the kings of Israel, when you read 1 and 2 Kings, he was the pits. He was a horrible, horrible man. Whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He did very abominable, abominable, abominably in going after idols. As the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. He was a bad, bad man. But when Ahab heard those words which God had sent Isaiah to tell him, he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. He heard God's word of judgment on him, well deserved. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. But in his son's days, I will bring the evil upon his house. See, if it was me, and I heard that Ahab was going to get, you've heard me pray about Putin. I just want God to get him. How would I feel if Putin repented and God forgave him? I'd be like the self-righteous brother. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? Yeah. He goes off and blows it all. He comes back and says, Daddy, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and Daddy forgives him. And the older brother says, What? You've forgiven him? That doesn't make any sense. That would not be my economy of mercy or grace. I haven't got it in me, naturally. But God does. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that you have done that God's love is not greater and deeper still. And he would say, I forgive you. That's amazing. So, if you're out of step with God, either now or at some later stage, it happens. Look, if you plot my Christian life, it's had its ups and downs. Okay? We all go through that. But God makes this promise in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If... Oh, it's one of those conditional promises I mentioned last week. If my people who are called by my name, Christians, Christians, you are called by God's name. If they humble themselves like Ahab and pray and seek my face and repent, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Yet righteousness is required for the Lord to hear our prayers. And we are never fully righteous or never consistently righteous. Okay? But it's so easy 
<clears throat> easy. Simple for us to turn back to God. Father, I'm sorry. I admit that it's wrong. And I don't want to continue in this cesspool that I'm living in. Lord, get me out of here. Help me to stop it, to walk in the light of your fellowship and presence. God says, you pray something like that. I'm all ears. I'll hear you. And I will forgive you. And I will heal. 1 John 1, 9, I didn't even bother putting it up, but one of the first verses I've memorized. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's my spiritual soap that I've almost worn out over the last almost 50 years now. Okay. But it's, it doesn't so, so diminishes and disappears, gets worn out. But God's love and mercy and forgiveness never get worn out. So as I pray, Father, is there any sin? Clear thou me from hidden faults. If I've done iniquity, I'll do it no longer. Lord, show me. I want to be in right relationship with you. The Spirit of God says, hey, yesterday you said that. And you've upset them. Oh, okay. I ring them up. I see them. I apologize. I ask God to forgive me. He says, okay, Costa, the decks are clear now. What's on your heart? Yeah. So righteousness is one of the conditions of answered prayer. And thank God the cross takes care of that for all of us. Okay, the second condition is faith. Hebrews 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Because anyone who comes to me must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, we know that's true because it's by faith that we come to the cross and acknowledge Jesus has died for us. He rose from the dead. And Lord, if I ask you in, you will come in. I believe it. And so we respond in faith. And now we're his sons, his daughters. That's incredible. But it's meant to keep on going. That we walk by faith, not by sight. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And I've racked my brain, why is that so? But that's certainly one. Uh, the first point is, it's by faith that I enter a relationship with him and have come to know his forgiveness. So, but we're to walk in faith in all areas of our lives, for the rest of our lives. And see, yeah, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Uh, the reward is that I'll find him. <laughs> James 1, 6 to 8. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. I've got to believe and not doubt. Well, let's see what Jesus, Jesus, he's elaborating what Jesus himself taught. Uh, from the Gospels in Matthew, let's see, Jesus said, Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. He says that to us today, According to your faith, be it done to you. If I look at the next verse. He did not do many mighty works there in his hometown because of their unbelief. They didn't believe Jesus could do anything. They didn't ask for, for his help or for his healing. And nothing happened. But earlier in Matthew, the invitation is, you trust God for it, believe it, and I'll make it happen. He responds to our faith. 
And in faith, therefore, we should ask. But not, fingers crossed, asked. Unless that's a picture of the cross of Christ. Some people think that's the origin of fingers crossed. But anyway, no. let's see. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 17, because of your little faith, for tri- now this is when he came down from the mountain, I'm pretty sure, yeah, of transfiguration, and there was a, a father whose son was possessed by spirits, and the, the other disciples couldn't heal the son. They said, well, how come, Lord, we've cast out demons before, what's going on? He said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move. And nothing will be impossible to you. That was his instruction. So it's not the size of the faith that matters. This is reminding me of a story. Uh, should I share it? Faith is only as valid as the object on which it is placed. I might believe that uh, this little thing will protect me from evil, but it's not going to work because it has no power. Here's a story I'd heard years ago. A guy is in the north of you know, Canada, Alaska, wherever it is, and it's getting dark and he wants to get home and it's the middle of winter and there's a frozen river between him and home. And he gets down his hands and knees and he, he crawls across the river and he gets across the other side. Yes! Okay? The ice was thick enough to get him across. So he's home. A month and a half later, he's in the same situation. He says, well, I crossed the river last time. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it again. So he walks across the river and splat right through the ice. He survives and he concludes, what matters is not the strength of my faith, but the thickness of the ice. Faith is only as valid as the object on which it is based. Our faith is in God his promises, his goodness, his love for us. Uh, I trust in God. Even a little bit of faith in God is much better than I've read my astrology chart today and it's going to be a good day, and I'm sure of it. It's not the power of positive thinking. Okay, That is not it at all. Even a little bit of faith, God will honour Nothing will be impossible to you. Now, is that a literal mountain? Well, I haven't quite tried it, you know. But I think mountain of a problem. Here's something, Lord, I can't see my way out. What are we going to do here? You know, you pray for that. And you know you're out of your depth. And God will answer it. Okay. So that's what Jesus taught about faith. Right, well... Why do we doubt? What do we doubt? I thought of two incidents in the Gospel of Mark. In Mark 9, 22, 23, I think this is where the Father spoke to me. Oh, I'm not sure now. No. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us, is what the people said to Jesus. And Jesus res- responds, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. He took offense that they said, Lord, if you can. Of course I can. Don't you know who I am? Sometimes we doubt that God can. Maybe this situation is a bit beyond him. The other side of what we doubt, Lord, do you not care? Here are the guys in the boat, Sea of Galilee, the storm. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care? He says, O men of little faith, and he stops the, the storm. 
Of course I care. Do you think I brought you out to the middle of the sea to drown you? Okay. We doubt God's power and we doubt his compassion. There's the two things, the two little voices in our head, the, or the Satan whispers in our ears, you know, not you. You're not important enough. God's busy. You have so much water under the bridge, such a bad track record. Forget it. These are the sort of things that Satan whispers in our ears. And they're the sorts of doubts that come into our heads. Well, what do you do about that? The father who said, Lord, if you can. Next slide, please. Yeah, it was the next slide. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my belief. Oh, unbelief. So, Lord, I admit it. I'm finding it hard to trust you for this. Um, so I'm not going to pretend to ask you. And then, uh, Lord, help me to trust you more. That's a valid prayer. Help me overcome my unbelief. Be real with God. Don't pretend everything is all right. Let him know you're afraid. He'll respond as any loving father will. I remember hearing a guy pray it was years ago. I was a young Christian and he had this relationship with a girl and uh, he wasn't willing to break up with her. And he, but he prayed, Lord, I'm not willing to break up with her, but Lord, I'm willing to be made willing. That's all I can say for now. Okay. You know, be honest with God. Help me overcome my unbelief. It was the father's response. Of course, Jesus healed the child and so on. Okay. And I thought about, well, praying without faith, why does that upset God? <laughs> if trusting God is honoring to him, then not trusting God dishonors him. And I thought, Lord, I'll pray to you, but just in case, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I'm consulting my astrologist. I'm rubbing my rabbit's foot. And I'll put on my lucky charm. You know, I'm covering my bets. Remember, God can read your heart and my heart. And if that's what's going on in here and in there, the Lord is going, what? Really? Why are you bothering talking to me? I'm just one of many resorts. Mm-mm-mm. I am your, not only your best resort in this situation, I'm your only resort. And to pray without believing that he will hear and respond and answer in his wisdom and love is insulting him. So that's why praying without faith is just a waste of time as we've seen a number of verses now. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Again, the storm at sea, the guys, no, Jesus said, okay, guys, you uh, head out across the sea. He's going to finish off praying. I'll catch up with you later. <laughs> so shortly before dawn, dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's I, it's me, don't be afraid. And Peter, he's a patron saint of those who put their foot in their mouths. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, Peter has been around water long enough in his fishing career to know that you don't walk on water. But if it's you, tell me to come. Come, he said. Now what would you do? <laughs> uh, just kidding, Lord. Good to see you. Come. 
Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why do you doubt? Do you see the lesson? If Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he would have kept on walking to meet him out on the lake. But what did he do? He took his eyes off the Lord. Wind, waves. What am I doing here? And the bubble burst. Down he went. I have said to my children many, many times since they were little, if you have a problem, if you look at the problem, the problem gets bigger and God somehow gets smaller. But if you have a problem and you look to the Lord, the Lord gets bigger and the problem gets smaller. Take your pick. How do you want to live? Keep your eyes on the Lord. Trust him. Makes me think of that incident. Uh, remember when God sent the fiery serpents to the people of Israel because of their rebellion? And Moses is to make a, a bronze serpent. How ridiculous is that? And the people told, if you look at the serpent, you won't have to worry about the snakes. They can't hurt you. Well, that required faith, didn't it? The action's down here. And you asked me to look up there? That was God's answer. And those who looked at the serpent, even if they were bitten, did not die. Faith. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't focus on the problem. Because if you do, I know from my experience, when I worried about something and continued to worry about it, the spiral is only one direction. Okay? So uh, look to the Lord, trust him, and he will deal with the problem for us. Praise God. If only we could see the reality. you now getting insight as to how my mind works. The Assyrian army was going to confront the prophet Elijah, and his assistant Gehazi was starting to panic. And so he, Elijah, said, Fear not, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then El Elisha, excuse me, prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. This is Jehazi. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire around about them. Round about Elisha. What a view. Horses and chariots of fire. And when the Syrian came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike them, strike these people, I pray thee, with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. Lord, I pray that he might see, I pray that they might not be able to see. But the point is. I believe, without being too fanciful, we are surrounded by angels and chariots of fire. Thank God he doesn't let us see them or else we'd be too distracted to cross the street, you know? But they are there. The angel of the Lord, of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Now, God doesn't want us to focus on angels, Okay. We have to focus on the Holy Spirit and God himself. The angels are there as ministering spirits to you know, help us to do that, etc. However, that's the reality. We are surrounded by spiritual forces of the Lord. And uh, I'll take that by faith, even though I can't see them. I know they're there. So I'm not alone. I need not be afraid of anything or anyone. Therefore, my beloved brethren, trust and obey. 
There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Obedience to live a clean life, a righteous life before the Lord. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. His will is good. His will is acceptable to me, to others. His will is perfect. So I want his will. And I want to live in a life of obedience and, and righteousness. So if you're doing something, if there's some relationship in your life or in a habit or whatever that's not pleasing to God, the Spirit of God is going, no, you're quenching me, you're grieving me. The thing to do is to, well, Spirit, uh, Father, I confess, I agree with you. I don't want, it is sin. I want it out of my life. Lord, please release its grip on me. If we confess our sin and forsake it, we receive God's mercy and help. So that's the righteousness. The trust, trust him with every area of your life. Pray in faith for him to meet your needs and the needs of others for whom you are concerned. We don't pray on Wednesday nights because there's nothing good on TV that night, so nothing better to do, might as well do that. And I don't think we pray because it's fun. We pray because we believe that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And we pray because we believe that the Lord has put people on our hearts. We want to see you grow in your walk with God, in your service for him, etc. And so, well, we can't affect that. I mean, I can talk for 30 minutes here and that'll make a little bit of change. But unless the Lord is watering that word in your heart and life, you know, it's a wasted half hour, isn't it? So we pray on behalf of others, not just ourselves, that the Lord will fulfill his purposes. How's your prayer life? You know, I've been thinking recently, the Muslims pray, what is it, five times a day? Five set times. When you go to a hotel in Singapore or Malaysia, there's a little arrow on the ceiling. It says Kiblat, is it? Did I remember that right? Mecca, that way. So they get down on their knees or the mat or without, whatever it is, and they face Mecca and they pray five times a day. Such devotion. Such legalism, perhaps. However, I might go there. But that's a challenge, isn't it? To us. Who are you praying for regularly? Who has the Lord burdened on your heart that you want to see them saved or grow or comforted, whatever their needs are? Yeah, I have like a circle of prayer. Every day, I promise you, I pray for my wife, I pray for my sons and the grandchildren. Every day. I don't need photos for that. They're already here, you know? And then, not quite every day, uh, there's one person here whose photo I need, but uh, I, I go through the, the photos I took of you a few weeks ago, and I pray for you as well, okay? My, my, my prayer circles. But who am I praying for? When do I pray? Do you have a regular time? Yeah, I have my regular morning Bible reading, fellowship with the Lord, and then I naturally then go into my intercession then. Well, how do I pray? Well, in faith, I trust. What am I praying for? Well, that's why we have those prayer cards over there that we want to be praying for your felt needs, okay? Not what we guess your needs are. So please, um, at the end of the table, pen, paper, put your name on it, what it is you'd like, 
the faithful five to be praying for, join the faith, faithful five if Wednesday nights are, are good for you. And if you come any other night, let me know what that night will be and we'll start a new prayer group. And why do I pray? Well, uh, cast all my anxieties on him for, for he cares about me. Um, let me go to a prayer conference, a conference and there was a thing on prayer and it said people only reach the point of really praying consistently when they come to believe John 15 5 I'm the vine you're the branches he who uh, uh, abides me and I in him no that, that's the he answered prayer apart from me you can do nothing if we really believe that we'll get to our knees a lot more often a lot more earnestly but if we think yeah prayers there you know sort of little honey on the dummy on the side then we'll never be consistent in our prayer life okay well why don't we just close in the word of prayer now father we thank you that you have made us righteous in christ so lord we have access to your throne and Lord, you've given us your spirit and he wants us to be holy. And Lord, we know we have a long way to go towards being holy. If there are things in our life that are displeasing to you, Lord, reveal it to us. Help us to confess it, forsake it. And Lord, to be, have a clear conscience towards you, for then you will really hear our prayers and respond. Father, we pray also, Lord, uh, help us in our unbelief. Lord, we want to grow in our faith and our confidence in you. We want to uh, truly pray believing and to see you move those mountains. The things that concern us in our lives and the lives of others uh, for whom we're concerned. Lord, I pray that each one of us will grow in our experience of your goodness through our prayer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.